Welcome to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. Hi, I'm David Manti, and welcome to a new episode of the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast. With me today is Vlad Balme. He is the Director of Sales at Thompson Duke Industrial. Thank you very much for joining me today, Vlad. Thanks for having me, David. Well, before we get started, I always like to ask people to please like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com. Let's get into it, Vlad. I always like to know a little bit about everybody's beginning as to what brought them into the cannabis industry. Uh, What was it specifically that uh, brought you here today? Um, you know, uh, it's it's been a long journey. I've been a long time cannabis user. I probably started in my late teens, um, and ever since um, partaking in the plant, I've just been fascinated by how diverse the plant is and how unique it is in in the cultivars. Um, so uh, it's just it just had me um, growing up in the East Coast. I did not have the diversity that I knew that the plant had. Um, so certain situations caused me to move to California and pretty much, you know, quit my, um, secure job in the IT field and say, Hey, I just want to start from scratch. And I just want to focus my life in cannabis. Um, and you know, that was early, uh, around mid two thousands. Um, and I came to California and pretty much started work my way up from being a bud tender to managing dispensaries. Um, to putting out a brand and then to working with various companies uh, in the space until I, I like to say I found my forever home with Thompson Duke Industrial. Okay. Um, What were you doing in the IT industry? Uh, So it pretty much, I was a uh, network admin um, and setting up servers and maintaining servers, which a lot of that is obsolete with the cloud. So maybe it's a good thing that I'm, I wasn't in the space anymore because a lot of the, the the functions that I was doing as IT is, I mean, there's like an app for that. Like I like to say <laughs> how that pretty much does everything that I was doing. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think it was a good pivot for me. When you started as a bud tender, were you happy with that role or was it always you wanted to sort of work your way up through the industry? I... Well, you know, you know what? That's an interesting question. I I think being the bud tender was and is my happiest position in the cannabis space. Um, But I knew that I could easily work up. I just needed the opportunity and it took a long time. The hardest part in this was getting to become a bud tender, because at that time I didn't know. And I moved to California and I didn't know anybody. Mm. So I kind of create a network. Um, But the experience of being a bud tender, I loved it. I absolutely loved it because It just reaffirmed everything that I believed in plant. Um, And when I was a bud tender, it was still in the days when, you know, our shops were getting raided, right? I I got arrested a couple of times in these shops being raided. So I I went through the whole experience. But on the other end of that, I, I mean, I was seeing people coming in on a daily basis and they were actually bettering their lives, um, with the use of cannabis, whether it was from arthritis or joint pains, um, just, just the stories and the testimonials that you can't get unless you're a bud tender and you're interacting with the people. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. When you're working and your place of business gets raided, how do you go back to work the next day? <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, you, you have to believe that you're doing the right thing and you're not doing, uh, you, you're not doing any malice. So if you believe you're doing the right thing it's easy to just wake up and do to do it again the next day um it was an interesting time because it was um we were getting raided so often that it was like hey see you next tuesday we're going to come raid you again it was that kind of relationship and you're like well we'll be here uh, we're not <laughs> um it, it was it, it was the definition of wild wild west um obviously that's not like that anymore and kudos to the guys that are um, but tending now, it's such a better space to do so because you just don't have that um, over your head. But, it, it, you know, because I was new to it and I, I, you know, left New York and I came here for the adventure, everything to me was an adventure. So good, bad or indifferent, it was worth it. How did you find yourself at uh, Thompson Duke? Um, so uh, bud tending. Uh, then again, like I was saying I was managing shops and as I was managing shops, I was looking for products 
that um, would help the senior clientels that we had. And I knew that vaping was the fastest form of um, a senior being able to get the medicine um, to get the relief that they're looking for. Uh, and there wasn't that many products available. So as I was uh, working at the shops, I was on a hunt for vaporizers that uh, that I can supply the shop with to, to sell to our clients. Um, that got me down the rabbit hole of finding the right vape cartridge, finding the right hardware. Um, and it kind of spiraled into um, understanding and building relationships with different hardware manufacturers. Um, and then into going into, okay, we've got this hardware, but how do we fill it? And how do we fill it the right way and make sure that everything is exactly what we say it is in it? Once you get to Thompson Duke, um, what was your first role there? Uh, sales. So I, I started out in Thompson Duke as sales. Um, I actually, I was working at another company and we were selling the Thompson Duke uh, product line um, down here in Los Angeles. Um, and that went well. We had some great success with that. And then just kind of kept the relationship with Thompson Duke because uh, as I was getting more into the, let's say, the, the legal industry, um, I was working for bigger and bigger companies. Um, and I'm I'm a guy that likes smaller companies. Mm. I like, you know, less than 20 people getting things done. Um, you can move a lot easier. Um, so I was always attracted to the model that Thompson Duke had because they had a small group with excellent equipment. So when I was selling their equipment, it was easy to sell because there was no issues with it. Um, and if they, we had to make any changes, the company was small enough to listen to the customers and make changes as needed. Okay. Um, what was it like transitioning from being on you know, the retail side of the business, consumer side of the business, over to the equipment side of the business? Um, it, it it was interesting. Again, like that, that's what uh, kind of made me realize like, hey, I do like the equipment space, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I do want to be in, in, a, in a smaller format. I had some background in dealing with equipment because I used to own a print shop. So mm -hmm. I was bringing in equipment and dealing with equipment all the time. So it kind of was second nature, um, but uh, it was very important for me um to find a company that i could stand behind because it was it's it wasn't just about selling equipment it was just about hey who's doing it right and who actually cares about what they're doing because that's important to me what time of what type of equipment does thompson duke manufacture so we manufacture a uh, cannabis oil vaporizer device filling and capping equipment yeah so, so our headquarters are in Portland, Oregon, um, and that's where our team designs, manufacts, manufactures, and distributes like a line of CETLUS and certified GMP ready machines designed specifically for filling and capping cannabis oil uh, and vaporizer devices. Are these devices primarily for you know small um, small operations in the cannabis industry, or are they even in some of the larger MSOs? Yeah, I, I think primarily we are in most of all the larger MSOs, mm -hmm. um, but we do also have our semi-automatic machine that caters to kind of um, the budding industry. So when there's newer markets, we know, hey, we'll start off with our semi-automatic machine because they're, they're proving the concept that it's going to work. Um, and as the company matures, then we have another line of machines, which is our IZR machine or our fully automated machine that can kind of take you from doing, you know, anywhere from 2,500 a day to 10,000 a day. Man. Um, have you been in some of those uh, facilities that are doing 10,000 a day? Oh, yeah. I, I, plus, I've, I've, I've been in facilities that are doing 50 to 100K a day. Oh, my um, goodness. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. It's a really amazing experience to see that we have working at Thompson Duke because we are able to go into facilities, kind of understand their operations and um, see their day to day activities. Very impressive, to say the least. Um, and not everyone is doing it the same, which is what something that I love, too, because there's so many different ways to get up the mountain. Um, so everybody has their own way of doing it. Uh, and we get to kind of be exposed to that and see and see what these people are doing. What type of ramp up are people looking at when they uh, bring in Thompson Duke equipment? Is it a lot of training? How is it to operate? Um, some of it, uh, what is the operational aspect like? Yeah, so and I, I 
one of the aspects I loved with uh, selling the Thompson Duke machines is the ease of use. Um, our semi-automatic machine, we, we literally can sell the machine and not even give you any training. You can open up the box, you'll have it set up and running in five minutes. And oh, wow. that has to do with the simplicity of the design. Um, we got to give it up to our engineers for that because it was designed in America for an American audience, right? So it's designed to make it as simple as possible, um, but yet super effective and accurate. Mm. Uh, so the training on these machines are are little to none. And once you get going, you got it. it it's not something you have to like, oh, we have to go over. We try to take away all the complications. Um, you see all the components. There's nothing hitting behind a box. You see everything in front of you. Um, and once you see how the oil moves through the machine, you not only understand how to use the machine better, but you understand your oil better, which is what I love. What is the landscape like for vaping and capping or vape filling and capping equipment? You know, what, is it a pretty competitive landscape? Uh, and how does Thompson Duke fit in? Are you more of the higher end option um, that comes with a little bit less trouble along the wayside? Um, where do you guys stand out amongst your competitors? Yeah, I, you know, for us, I, I feel like we're more of the a higher end option um, because we've, one, we've kind of weathered a lot of storms because we, we've seen vape companies come and go. Um, and we understand that uh, this market, it's not, it's not like other industries, right? So uh, again, I told you I have a little bit of um, experience in the printing industries. A lot of different printers you can purchase. A lot of them have longevity, um, and that market is kind of solid. Uh, what we notice a lot in this industry is we'll have a lot of other companies coming in with machineries, and they're looking at it not the way that we look at it. So we look at it as how do we accurately and efficiently deliver oil into your devices? And we, I notice that other companies are like, hey, how do we put something together and sell it for the most amount of money? Mm -hmm. um, not really support it, not really um, think about growth or long-term um, ideas, but just like, hey, it's a cash grab um, and let's let's do that. But the cannabis industry is so young. Um, and I think uh, at Thompson Duke, we, we look at it like, hey, we're helping to grow this industry and an industry that you're helping to grow. We don't want our machines to be in a facility and not being used. Mm -hmm. uh, so for us, it's like, the quality, it, that's why our name is Industrial, Thompson Duke Industrial. The quality is there. You have an industrial um, built machine, um, and that's going to be a complete workhorse. So, you know, we look at ourselves at a different tier than most of the other options out there. Would you say that some of those fly-by-night cash grab type companies or competitors have mostly gone by the wayside uh, now as the market has matured? It, it's, some have. Um but, you know, it's it's one of those things where some some have gone away and then new ones pop up, but then they have their own life cycle, which it might last a year or two. And then the same thing happens. I think that's all good. Uh, I, I don't look at it as direct competition. I look at it as building the story. Right. Because we're even though it's a different way of doing things, we're all trying to build this industry in a sense. Um, it's just that we're 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 here for the long term. You'd mentioned the market as a whole. I'd like to take a look at the vape market and kind of get your perspective on it. Um, you mentioned a little bit about how you saw the vape market initially uh, catering towards seniors. What was what what was the history of the vape market? Uh, where does it stand now, and what are your expectations for it going forward? Yeah, I, I think you know, and and this is my view from living in California and kind of seeing it play out here. Um, you know, when when vapes first started becoming popular in California, there were three brands, I believe, that kind of piloted the vape cartridge phase in the cannabis industry altogether. And, and it was like Open Vape, Eureka and a company called Pure Vape. Uh, all three of these companies introduced vape cartridges um, to the market. Uh, and it, it wasn't they weren't specifically targeting seniors. But seniors were buying it because they had more disp disposable income. Um, so vape cartridges were like sixty to eighty dollars um, when they first came out. So that wasn't something that someone who who would go to the market uh, would spend. Who was younger, younger people would just buy maybe 
thirty dollars uh, in an eighth or something of some sort of flower uh, product or maybe an edible. Um, I see the landscape changing because vaping has just grown dramatically. Um, I think it's probably if maybe the second or third biggest in the space. Um, so we're just seeing it grow more and more. Um, and, and that's really impressive because we went through, um, obviously COVID and we went through a vape crisis, mm. right? And even after all of that, it's still holding as a huge um, section of the industry. Um, so I, I see it expanding. And as we're, we're tracking it, not only in the U.S., we're tracking it in Canada and in Europe. And we just see it's the same trend. It, it starts off slightly, um, but it picks up so tremendously. And um, it's, it's a testimony from our customers who are buying our semi-automatic machine, let's say in a newer market. And then before the end of the year, they're like, hey, we need an automatic machine because we went from, you know, five to 10,000 carts a month to now we have orders of 100,000 a month. Um, it just grows. So every market, we kind of expect that that's the kind of um, growth that we will see. Were you at Thompson Duke during the vape crisis? Yes. Yes. What What was that like? That was interesting because um, you you just don't <laughs> you just don't know what's gonna happen. So you're just like you you understand because I was in California, um, and you 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 know that there are some questionable activities in the products that people are filling in vapes, and um, you don't know what's gonna happen. And um, it it was kind of a great thing that that did happen because it really showed how mature the industry is because it's self, the industry self-regulated itself. Um, and they stepped up to bat and they were like, hey, we do not want to be associated with any of these um, like cutting agents that are being used um, and harming people. So we're going to make sure that we're going to stop that from happening before any other you know, jurisdiction has to come in and tell us what to do. And so it was scary for us because we were like, is this the end? Mm. Uh, like, is this going to stop? But to be quite honest, the, the popularity of vaping is so vast that, you know, it was just a small hiccup. Yeah. I mean, it definitely seemed like it could have been that rallying point that really did the industry in. But uh, you think it was the um, the quality of the product or just the demand uh, for vapes that kind of um, helped it see it, helped see it through? I, I, and and the response of the industry, the, the response of the different companies. I can't tell you how many different companies were like, hey, we're going to do extra testing. We're going to test everything from because before they were only testing the oil. Now they're like, we're going to test all our hardware. We're testing everything. It just made the industry sharpen their pencils and say, all right, we're going to put out a product. We're going to continue putting out products, but we're going to do all of the, the due diligence on our end to make sure that what we put out is something that we feel is 100% safe and not, you know, harm anybody. Is the vape side of the business, is there an opportunity for a craft side of the industry like you see a lot in flower? Or is the vape business uh, more of a commodity product? No, I, 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 I think there is a huge space for craft. Um, but not to say the commodity gets it to the masses, the craft dials in the people who really want high-end stuff. So I, I am grateful for, let's say, the distillate cartridges there because it really puts it into the hand of people who would never try it. Um, but then after you try it, then you can say, hey, I wonder if there's better. And that was something that I did when I first tried cannabis, tried cannabis growing up in the East Coast. We didn't get the best cannabis. Um, but it led me into the journey of, hey, is there something better than this? Like, can I look around and find something better. And the craft, I, I can't tell you how much the craft has grown this year into like, let's say rosin or live resin, small batch um, produced products for um, the vape space, which is my absolute favorite. Um, it's growing, the, the demand for it is growing and it's really just showing how the market is receptive to that. So vape is your favorite? That's your uh, preferred over, you know, flower edibles? Yeah, over my favorite form of consumption is going to be vaping. I, I again, I do love flour. I do love uh, joints. I do love. I love breaking up flour. It's it's 
one of my favorite things to do, just smelling it, the whole experience and touching it and the residue in your fingers and such. Um, but what I love about that, you can get in a craft vape. Like some of these rosin vapes are better than you can ever smoke uh, a flower because the flower, as you're smoking it, you might get one or two good hits that really give you the actual taste and feel of the plant. But the rest of it is going to be a smoky mixture of burnt um, plant matter and stuff like that. But these um, rosin vapes, um, my gosh, they are, it, it tastes like sitting in a field of cannabis. And, and I um talking about live resin the live resin vape industry so sales in 2021 were up 87 percent i believe um how does that impact the vape filling and capping equipment industry is it a struggle to keep up it it's you know it's not a it's not a huge struggle to keep up but it is um it does t require a lot on our end to make sure that we are not running out of machines so we have do, you know yearly and and we do this uh often it's just like how do we how do we order enough to, to keep up with the demand because you just don't know when something is going to take off and cause a spike in the industry right and you don't want to be sitting on a lot of machines because now you have your money tied up on inventory sitting there so you know we we're always going back and forth like hey do we do we feel like we need to ramp up and get more machinery um, or are we good? Are we going to just ride out for a couple of months and see how things happening? One of the greatest things is we build the machines here in the U.S. in Portland. Um, so we have a little bit more flexibility in what we can do, right? We can have machines partly, partly build and then get the final components as needed. Um, so we just have a little bit more um, flexibility in our, in our production. Has Thompson Duke Industrial faced any of the supply chain issues that have been hitting other equipment manufacturers? Yeah, I think we've we faced all of them, um, you know, specifically with, you know, uh, just the metals used in, in our machines, the, the Delrin in our trays, um, every aspect of our industry, the chips, boards, you know, everything in our in, in our in our machines have been kind of uh just in a precarious situation these past few months. Um, but we've been able to figure out, hey, how do we fit in and how do we just um, stay alive and make sure we can supply uh, the demand? And we've been doing a good job. I, I got to say, we've been doing a good job of that. Uh, what are your lead times look like right now? So we have machines built. We are, we, and this is one of the greatest things we did. We've, we kind of went heavy for this year. Um, so we have machines built ready to ship. Um, so we're, we're not dealing with um, heavy lead times. Uh, you know, we, 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 we stocked our inventory really well to make sure that we can ride out this year without any issues. Oh, well, that's incredible foresight. Um, and uh, when you look, when you're talking to new customers or potential clients, uh, what kind of ROI are they looking at when they bring a new house or a new machine in house? Yeah, I mean, you're 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 looking at getting that return within a month. I mean, you've got guys that are spending um, outsourcing their filling. Um, let's say they're they're paying anywhere upwards from sixty five cents to a dollar fifty for filling. So you bring in one of our machines, um, and you get that money back. Honestly, within one run of the machine, or if if you know, depending on on the volume that you're doing, you're going to get that money back within the month. So it pays for itself relatively quickly. So what is the biggest obstacle for people bringing these machines or more machines in house? Is it the capital investment? Uh, is it, you know, uh, lack of manpower to run the machine? I, you know, no, I, I think it is the capital investment. I, you know, um, the, the cannabis industry is real scrappy. So they're like, hey, let's do the most we can with the least amount of expenditures. Um, and when you have that mentality, sometimes it's hard to, to show people, Hey, you can do a lot more if you spend a little money. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's going to make the whole thing easier. Right. So a lot of people are like, Hey, I've been hand filling and I can, ha I can hand fill thousands of cards. We don't need a, a, a machine. Um, but the reality is it frees them up to grow the business in other areas. Um, because, you know, if you're just it by hand you're you're kind of locking yourself into a situation where other 
parts of your industry uh, uh, of your business isn't growing. Well, and I have to imagine that moving to a more automated solution helps with things like consistency, efficiency, and then eventually scalability. Yes, uh, I, I think those are kind of our, our biggest points because um, a lot of companies out there would like to try to sell you on speed. And we're not in the speed conversation because we like accuracy. Um, because if we can accurately fill it the way to the amount that you want every time, we can always make it faster. But accuracy is number one for us. Um, and once once people understand that and understand that you have a lot less waste, right, um, in your runs, in your batches, then it, it then it starts adding up. Once they realize how much they're losing in um, hand filling or filling with um, not accurate machines that have cleaning cycles that waste a lot of material or they're not able to get their material out of the machine, then, and you you kind of lay it out for them like, hey, you're actually losing a lot more money. You The money that you're losing, you could buy one of our machines and you can be making more money off of um, your whole process. What, what are some of the more common um, pain points where waste happens in the process for hand filling and other processes? Well, uh, for hand filling, it's it's just that the motion of drawing a syringe um, and then filling it into a cart, and then you have a bunch of leaks coming out of the syringe tip as you fill the cart. So now you're wiping that down, right? And then that can that adds up, right? You're filling thousands of carts, and each time you're wiping the needle tip, that adds up. Or if you're underfilling, overfilling, that's adding up also. Um, so it's it's just. Uh, it's just the efficiency in the processes. And, and then there's some machines that will want you to run your oil through a long line, um, which is impossible to clear out with um, your materials. So now you're just losing product in, in the lines just to feed to uh, filling uh, your device. So there's so many a- aspects that people are losing, um, just kind of losing their oil. Um, and we, we, we worked our machines to not have that happen. I mean, you're you can fill thousands of carts and probably not lose more than a half a gram um, in that whole process, and and half a gram is a lot. Mm. I understand that it's a hugely popper popular category right now, but doesn't a brand still have a great deal of risk if they're not offering, you know, consistent products? Uh, on a regular basis to the consumer? Yes, for sure. Um, and, and, and that's why it's, it's great to have um, like standard uh, distillate pens and, and, you know, a lot of brands are, are scared to pivot into offering um, let's say resin or rosin cartridges um, because they just know they have this core um, clientele that likes the price point and the, the, effectiveness of the products that they're already putting out. So we have this conversation a lot. They're like, uh, these brands are like, hey, we're, we're looking to put solventless products out um, or we're looking to put live resin products out. It doesn't, the oils are completely different from distillate. One, can your machine handle it, which we can, our machine can handle it. It's kind of, it's built pretty much to handle any type of oil. Um, can your machine handle it? And two, you know, they, they come to us like, Hey, what is your feedback? What are you seeing there in the industry? Is this a good move? Is this something that our company should focus on? Um, and we always encourage them that it is because we see from our point of view, we can see the growth of the industry and and how brands are switching to, even if it's like just a small sector. So let's say maybe distillate, they're producing 10,000 distillate pens on a weekly basis, add in maybe 500 um, live resin pens into the queue and then just see how it does. And some brands do it slowly and that thing ramp, it ramps up so quickly because the demand always, most brands that, that introduce these newer high end, um, oils sell out instantly because mm. the, the, the community wants it. The community definitely wants it. From an operational standpoint, you know, oil can be relatively messy, difficult to clean. Um, what are companies looking at when it comes to cleanability of the machines, uh, maintenance, just to make sure that they're up and running, and uh, uh, safety as well? Yeah. Um, so just cleanability, it's, it's, it's a huge thing. We have this discussion a lot. 
you know, our machine has four components that touch oil. Um, so it makes it, and it's, all of the components are visible. So the, we have a reservoir um, that holds the oil. It's a heated reservoir. That reservoir is um, a continuous pour. So as you're, as you're filling carts, you can continuously pour more oil into the, into the reservoir um, to kind of top it off to continuously um, fill carts. Cleaning that is a breeze. Um, that's, it, it's pretty much a huge syringe. So you have a plunger for it. You could also you can also um, use a tool to scrape out any oil that's in it. It's a glass it's a glass uh, reservoir, so it's easy to kind of take any residual oil out of that. Um, the machine itself, the the whole cleaning process is less than five minutes, um, so you can clean out the machine and have um, a new set of components on the machine ready to fill in, in under five minutes. And that that's something that was important to us because we wanted to make it quick but we didn't want to make any points where oil is trapped and cannot be removed and had to be soaked out. Are these components that are swapped out and then cleaned or are they more uh, like single use? No, um, they're swapped out and cleaned. So so we have the glass syringe. Like I said, that's something that you can use pretty much endlessly. Mm -hmm. um, we have a tubing that connects the, uh, the reservoir to our valve. Um, uh, and our valve is um, what the oil travels through to go to our dispenser range where you select the volume and then that dispenses out the exact volume that you that you selected. Uh, all of those components are easy to clean. Um, the, the process that it goes through is pretty much drawing in the oil and pushing it out. Mm -hmm. So that's how the cleaning process is. You're drawing in the ethanol, whatever the cleaning solution is. And you're just flushing it out of the components. And then that's pretty much it. it it's a couple of uh, pumps out of um, with the cleaning solution. And then you can see it just be clear. The longest time is probably letting it dry. Oh, Let okay. it dry it just to make sure it's fresh and it can be used again. Um, what is the product line like in terms of cost? What is the sort of entry point and how large can some of these systems get? Yeah, so entry point is is just under ten thousand dollars. So like eight thousand dollars, you can get into our semi automatic machine. Um, something like that is going to be able to produce a, a minimum twenty five hundred um, fill devices uh, in a day. Uh, we've we've got guys that are using that machine and they're they're filling up to like four to five thousand in a day. Um, and that's just a single operator in front of a machine just going at it. Um, and then if you're going to step up into uh, a fully automated solution, you're looking at in the 35,000 range, um, and that's going to get you a, a solution that you can just put your carts into uh, into the machine. Um, we design special jigs or trays depending on who's your um, cart manufacturer, supplier. Um, you put it into the machine, you press run, and it runs. You can turn your back, do something else, come back, the tray's done. What are some of the features some of your clients are asking for now that you know might, we might see come along on next generation products? Um, you know, one of the the biggest things that we actually just released is uh, a second heater. So we had the reservoir was heated, um, and then we have um, lights that we use as ambient heat to um, to heat up the pathway as the oil is traveling through. We have a three inch tube that hooks up the reservoir. Um, to our valve. So we had, we were using lights to produce that ambient heat. Um, but what we just came out with, um, and it's going to be probably a standard in all of our machines moving forward, is a second heater at, at our valve point. Um, and the valve point is pretty much the last point that the oil touches before being dispensed. So being able to control the amount of heat that that valve, uh, the, the heat that that valve is at, um, is an important thing. Um, and that was something that we came to and um, were able to listen to our uh, clients um, as a as a positive feedback as, hey, this would really help us um, efficiently run this machine. OK, um, we ran the news that you guys recently sold, I believe it was your 1000th MCF1 vape cartridge filling machine. Uh, you know, when you started with Thompson Duke, did you ever imagine that you would have this many machines out in the market? It, I, I'm going to say yes. And the only reason I'm going to say yes is I, I've worked for other 
I, I worked for another filling machine company before Thompson Duke. And I knew that there really wasn't anybody else in the space catering to what the clients needed mm. um, because uh, th- there's just not too many options that work. So it's not surprising. I, I just didn't think we would reach it that fast. What What's the most surprising is how fast the industry's grown. That's probably the most surprising part about it. But I, I knew that this solution would be the solution because of how it was thought about. What are your expectations for the market going forward? Do you, uh, what are your, when do you think if it ever will go federally legal and uh, how might that impact Thompson do? You know, I, we, we, we operate um, as if our, our goal is our machines are, are GMP ready, right? So we are operating as if it's already federally legal and we would have to go through all the hoops that you would have to go through to have your machine in a GMP facility. So we have our CETLUS certification. Um, we, we, we spent the extra money in making sure that our equipment is going to be future-proofed, which is we believe legalization will come, who knows when, um, but newer states that are coming on to with legalization, um, like New York, they're talking about, hey, this is gonna have to be in a GMP facility. So I think that's the next conversation, like legalization, federal legalization is coming, but all of the facilities nationwide are going to have to probably maybe step up um, their quality and their processes to keep up with what traditional industries um, standards are. Um, so I think that's what what the growth is, is going to be coming. And that's what we've been working on to to be sure to be ahead of that and be a leader in that. So you moved from New York to California to move into a legal cannabis market. Now that New York's opening up, any uh, any chance that you move back? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I I um you know California is an addicting place to be. It's beautiful weather, um, and just uh, a a lot of lovely farms around. Um, it's just it's it's a magical place, and I do love New York. I I was living there for the first thirty years of my life. It amazing state to grow up in, um, but I, I'm so happy that I moved to California. But I, I'm kind of envious of all uh, the people who are in New York, and they're so excited for the market. And I'm I'm excited for them. I'm excited for them. But because I lived in California, I kind of experienced it already. And I'm like, I don't even want to go through the start of the market. It's it's fun and it's a lot of diciness at the same time. Well. Will the company stay in the vape filling and capping market, or do you see it branching off into other product categories? I, I think this is our lane, and, and that's another reason why we're good at it. We we know where we stand in the industry. We're not trying to be everything to everyone. We're trying to be the best at what we do, um, and I think we're doing a good job. So we're, we're going to be staying in our lane, and we're going to keep um, supporting our clients and supporting the industry as it grows. Are most of your sales primarily in... California and the Pacific Northwest, or are you seeing sales kind of across the country now? Um, mostly across the country. It's funny because, you know, markets like California and Colorado, we, in the past, we would say like, hey, I think we've sold to everybody that we can in these markets, but companies change directions and change leaderships. And we always find that, hey, there's a company that's been in California that needs some machines. And we're, we're, we're always surprised. We're like, oh, I'm, su- I'm surprised we didn't sell to them already yet. Um, but most of our clients now are coming from newer states and they're, we don't advertise highly. So a lot of this is word of mouth, which, which we love, right? So we have, you know, consultants who ran operations in California now in Oklahoma and they're like, Hey, we're starting something in Oklahoma. We know your machines rock. We need to get this for this facility. And then just copy exactly what you guys did for us in California here. Um, so, um, as these newer markets are opening up, most of the people that are opening up those newer markets come from the older markets um, mm-hmm. and and they're bringing us with them. And that's a, we're so grateful for that. In your opinion, is there anywhere that vape cartridge manufacturers are missing right now? Um, vape car, no, you know, I it's so hard to say because um, it's still a growing market. So 
it's you you have to feed more even though it's the the that sector is growing rapidly there's still so many more consumers that need to be uh reached before we can kind of get a picture of what the the market really should look like um so i think we're we're doing a good job in just putting out product putting out clean product that's the number one thing the vape crisis helped clean up what uh or just define what clean product is and as long as we stay on this path we're going to have a lot of data that we can look back at and be like all right this is how we can move forward and grow this market in a different way well vlad i really do appreciate you taking the time today um before we get out of here is there anything in particular that you want to make sure the cannabis equipment news audience knows about thompson duke industrial or yourself personally yeah, you know, I, I just want to say, yeah, our, all our machines are made in the USA, and we're super proud of that because, um, you know, we look at this industry growing and we want this industry to help the nation, right? So being able to be uh, a supplier of machinery made in the USA, we're, we're, we're proud to stand behind what we make and the quality of what we make. We source our, you know, our steel and our parts from the USA. So it's just we like to keep it in uh, in our circle. Uh, so I you know, just want to let people know that, you know, hey, we're probably one of the longest standing um, vape filling manufacturers, uh, equipment manufacturers in the industry. Um, and even though we're not out advertising all around, um, if you ask about us, you'll hear great reviews. If people are looking for more information, is there a way to reach out to you or just go to the website? What, what do you think? think? Yeah, uh, please visit the website. Um, Tons of information. We have spec sheets. We have um, a lot of good data on our website uh, on the machine. Um, you could reach me direct at Vlad at ThompsonDuke.com or you can visit our website at ThompsonDuke.com. Is there one client in particular that's doing it better than everybody else? Uh, man, that's a tough one. We have a lot of uh, favorite clients. I would say, um, I, you know, I, I, I won't mention names, but we do have some clients that are operating like they're in a GMP facility. Um, and we respect that because they don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that, you know, they chose to, they're like, this is the standard that we're going to hold ourselves to. And, um, and that's what they're doing. And we love to see that because it's, it's an option, right? You don't have to MacGyver everything to put it together. You you could hold yourself to a higher place. Um, so whenever we see anything like that, um, it, it makes us happy. On the other side of that, do you ever send a machine to a facility and then go on a site visit and realize, oh, that machine's coming back soon? You know what? Never coming back soon. Uh, we, we, we're, we pride ourselves on not having to take back machines because they don't work. Um, but you know, I've been in facilities where it's like, hey, they're 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 making it harder on themselves throughout this process because they're trying to do it in a way that's not going to be advantageous for them. Um, and you know, something like that, we uh, we just have to slowly work with them and and just share what we know and hope that they you know take it. Excellent. Well, Vlad. Thanks again, man. I really did uh, appreciate learning more about yourself, your contributions to the industry, and about Thompson Duke Industrial. I appreciate it. Thank you for the time. All right. Before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to email the podcast, you can reach me at david at cannabisequipmentnews.com. All right. For Vlad Valme, I'm David Manti. This is the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Cannabis Equipment News Podcast.